Marilyn Manson. The beautiful people, the beautiful oh. people. One of the most popular shock rock musicians starting from the 90s going all the way to current day. Brian Warner, otherwise known as Marilyn Manson, is one of the largest icons for expressive American culture. But his public reputation would change on February 1st, 2021. Actress and ex-girlfriend of Manson, Evan Rachel Wood, along with several other women, all came forward with public posts on social media, sharing extremely serious and horrifying accusations against the iconic rock star. This created a lot of backlash against Marilyn Manson by many of his fans. With so many breadcrumbs already discovered prior to Evan Rachel Wood publicly naming Warner, most importantly her involvement with starting the Phoenix Act years prior, it became very easy to believe the accusations made against him. As time had gone on, a documentary had been released where Wood shared her story and gathered with other women who had also made claims against Warner. But this would not be released on HBO before Manson filed a lawsuit against Evan Rachel Wood, along with her current partner, Elma Gore, an activist that, despite not having her own experiences with Warner himself, has played a large role in organizing this documentary. Ilma Gore and Evan Rachel Wood are now being accused of coordinating an attack against against Marilyn Manson. Manson and his legal team are demanding a trial by jury against Wood and Gore in this 28-page lawsuit. Warner is suing them for infliction of emotional distress, defamation, violation of the Comprehensive Computer Data and Access Fraud Act, along with impersonation over the internet. In today's video, we will be going over a large portion of this 28-page lawsuit, discussing the contents of the Phoenix Rising documentary, as well as some additional accounts and information regarding the accusations. Some of you may remember that last year, when the accusations originally came out, I made a video discussing my thoughts on the matter at that point. Since then, with developing information, some of my thoughts have changed. I think quite a few people at this point are feeling very confused and unsure of what to believe. While this video is very long, I encourage you to watch it until the very end. But just in case you can't, let's go over a brief summary of the lawsuit and the accusations that have been made up to this point. About a year ago, I made a video discussing the accusations made against Marilyn Manson, and there have been quite a few updates, and I figured it would be really important to share those with you. On February 1st, 2021, Evan Rachel Wood, along with several other women, have posted public statements on their social media accusing Brian Warner, aka Marilyn Manson, of several forms of physical, psychological, and sex abuse. This includes accusations of the R word made by Evan Rachel Wood and others. Since these posts have been made public, over a dozen women have come out with similar accusations against Warner. In my previous video linked down below, I have read some of the posts made by several of the women publicly accusing Warner of these horrible acts. One thing that I didn't cover very heavily in that video is that so far there have been a total of four women who have actually filed lawsuits against Warner, three of which were filed in 2021. Ashley Morgan Smithline, a model and also ex partner of Manson's, has filed a lawsuit against Warner accusing him of S.A., sexual battery, intentional affliction of emotional distress, unlawful imprisonment, and human trafficking. This lawsuit, filed on June 29, 2021, also had a jury trial demanded. In another article titled Marilyn Manson Accuser Files Amended Lawsuit Detailing Alleged S.A., Ashley Walters, Manson's former assistant, had also filed a lawsuit against him in May of 2021 for S.A essay and battery. It was stated that Walters also claims that Manson's lawyers have threatened her with retaliatory legal action if she were to participate in Evan Rachel Wood's Phoenix Rising documentary. According to Rolling Stone, Manson's lawyers attempted to have the lawsuit thrown out in January of 2022 on basis of statute of limitations, but the judge overseeing the case declined to rule on that until a later date, so the lawsuit is now amended, from what I understand. Game of Thrones actress Esme Bianco has also filed a lawsuit against Manson and his former manager, Tony Chula, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, on May 30th, 2021, with accusations that Manson R-worded her and battered her. There was also one Jane Doe lawsuit at some point that had been dismissed due to the statute of limitations. Before Evan Rachel Wood publicly named Warner as her, she was very involved with fighting domestic 
states politically. In 2019, the Phoenix Act was created, which extended California's statute of limitations, helping survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. So since my last video, Eben Rachel Wood, one of the biggest voices speaking out against Marilyn Manson, was involved in a documentary on HBO called Phoenix Rising, and this documentary had released just a few weeks ago. I'm here today to talk about Brian Warner also known to the world as Marilyn Manson. Right before the documentary was released, however, Marilyn Manson actually filed a lawsuit against Evan Rachel Wood along with Ilma Gore. As we'll see later on when we go over portions of the lawsuit, Elma Gore does appear to be a suspicious character in this entire situation. She is closely linked with Evan Rachel Wood and is involved with the other alleged survivors, as well as the Phoenix Rising documentary. Manson accuses Gore of hacking into his social media and computer software to not only obtain personal information, but also impersonate him on several occasions. Another big claim made against her is that her involvement with the Phoenix Act and going after Manson is done with the intent of making money. Gore's response to this on Twitter did not paint her in a favorable light either. As she first says, Bring it the f on, you vile mother and then she follows up with, Before publishing images, be aware that photos and images from my hard drives have been registered with U.S. Copyright Office. The documentation names me as the rightful copyright owner. I have not nor will give permission to use them. Obviously, my art and my life have long been magnets for controversy, but these recent claims about me are horrible distortions of reality. She later deleted the second response. Many speculate it being an incriminating confession that Manson's accusations of her were true. Ilma has yet to confirm or deny this, however. Ilma Gore and Evan Rachel Wood are also being accused of faking a letter by an FBI agent. In Manson's lawsuit, the letter is provided as well as text messages allegedly between Gore and Wood reviewing the letter. They are also being accused of soliciting other women to coordinate an attack on Manson's character and ruin his reputation by going the means of allegedly editing scripts and making checklists. Now let's get into some more details about all of this. Sit down, get cozy, maybe grab a snack or a drink because we're going to be diving into a very large portion of this lawsuit. But for full disclosure, I will not be going over the entire lawsuit. We will be jumping around a bit throughout the pages. So if you would like to read the full thing yourself, it will be linked in the description below. With that being said, let's begin. This action arises from the wrongful and illegal acts done in a furtherance of conspiracy by defendant Evan Rachel Wood and her on-again, off-again romantic partner, defendant Ashley Gore, aka Ilma Gore, to publicly cast plaintiff Brian Warner, aka Marilyn Manson, as a and abuser, a malicious falsehood that has derailed Warner's successful music, TV, and film career. Wood was in a serious romantic relationship with Warner from 2006 to 2010, during which time she soaked up the spirited rock and roll lifestyle that came with being Warner's significant other. For the first time, I really feel like I'm around somebody in an environment where I can just let go and not worry about being judged. She was craving danger and excitement, and she would later explain being with Manson put my creativity into overdrive. Despite Warner's public shock rocker persona, they had, in Wood's word, a healthy, loving relationship. This is who I am and this is who I've always wanted to be. I'm finally with somebody who lets me be who I want to be. In the 10 years after they split, Wood never once accused Warner of abuse. That is, until she met Gore, a grifter who understood that an organized attack on Warner, spearheaded by Wood's own fabricated revelation of abuse could benefit them both. With Gore's help, Wood would be rebranded from somebody who still might be best known for dating Marilyn Manson a decade ago into an outspoken standard bearer for victims of domestic violence or thereby absolving her reputation for having a, quote, wild past and her embarrassment for having been in a long-term relationship with Marilyn Manson. To that end, for at least the last two years, Gore and Wood have secretly recruited, coordinated, and pressured prospective accusers to emerge simultaneously with allegations of
and abuse against Warner and brazenly claim that it took 10 or more years to, quote, realize their consensual relationships with Warner were supposedly abusive. Wood and Gore's wrongful conduct in furtherance of their conspiracy is staggering. I want to take a break here for a second to say something. Don't worry, later we're going to get into the claims that Evan and Ilma allegedly coordinated accusers to go against Manson, but I really wanted to mention that I do not like the way that they worded this part here. It took them 10 or more years to, quote, realize their consensual relationships with Warner were supposedly abusive. The entire purpose of their cause, the Phoenix Act, was to extend the statute of limitations for people who have suffered domestic violence and or sexual abuse. This is because it is statistically proven that yes, it can take years and years for survivors of abuse to realize that they were in fact abused. This is by no means unique to this case alone. According to WomenAgainstAbuse.org, many often have to make several attempts to finally leave an abusive relationship, and according to SaveLives.org.uk, on average, abuse survivors take 2.3 to 3 years before getting help. And that's just getting help, mind you. Not going public with any accusations against a public figure, or figuring out the financials to take that particular person to court over abuse. This is just reaching out for help to hopefully leave the situation. This website even mentions that on average, 50 incidents occur before getting effective help. There's also an entire study done on why women stay in abusive relationships on the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, or NCADV.org. Not only that, but yes, this documentary did come out 10 years after Evan Rachel Wood and Manson finally broke up, but when did he date the other women involved in this? At least one of the relationships took place sometime after. On top of that, Evan Rachel Wood has been active with this Phoenix Act for years, and despite not mentioning Manson's name, many have pieced together that it would have had to be Manson due to certain dates and timings that had lined up, and this was before she ever publicly named him. Anyway, I'm getting off track now. I just wanted to say that I really do not like how dismissive this one part sounds, not just to people involved in this case, but to any survivor of abuse who takes years to come to terms with the fact that yes, they were in fact abused. Let's get back into this because there are some things that I I am concerned about, like this next thing we're about to read. They impersonated an actual agent of the FBI by forging and distributing a fictitious letter from the agent to create the false appearance that Warner's alleged victims and their families were in danger, and that there was a federal criminal investigation of Warner ongoing. Now they do reference this a bit, so let's take a look at that. To whom it may concern, please be advised that Miss Evan Rachel Wood is a key witness in connection to a criminal investigation in Los Angeles, California, involving an international and well-known public figure, the safety of Miss Wood, her family, other victims, and their families are the utmost concern during this time. Contact for more information regarding the safety of victims, human, and sex trafficking crimes. They provided checklists and scripts to prospective accusers, listing the specific alleged acts of abuse that they should claim against Warner, attachments B and C. So this first page just looks like a checklist of things that may or may not have happened. It sort of looks more like an application than some sort of script. To me, it personally looks like they made this up maybe to organize all of the accusers and figure out what happened to who and be better organized with it, but maybe I'm just giving it too much of the benefit of the- You could definitely say that this looks like an effort of coordination, but this doesn't look like an effort of forcing someone to say something. It looks like they're trying to organize what happened to who, and people get to fill out what their experience was. Now, the next page kind of does look like a script, but more of like a rough draft of something somebody wants to say. To me, this kind of sounds like a self-written, pre-planned basis for talking points. And I don't necessarily find that as out of the ordinary. I mean, maybe I have a bias here because what I do is create a lot of videos and I pre-script things and I write out what I want to say, whether it be me covering somebody else's story or me sharing some of my own thoughts on things. In both occasions, I have pre-written certain points, so I make sure I land on those and don't forget to say things. And I can only imagine that when you're talking about something as traumatizing as alleged going through physical 
else. You want to make sure that you're not forgetting anything and that you're sharing your experience to the best of your ability. And when you're trying to recall that on just memory alone, it can mess you up. So I don't think it's completely unreasonable to have some stuff written down as talking points so that you're not forgetting it. I think what I would really like to see is more evidence pointing to Ilma Gore or Evan Rachel Wood writing scripts for other people to say. This just looks like somebody's handwritten notes to remember what they want to say before they're interviewed. Back to page three on the lawsuit. They made knowingly false statements to prospective accusers, which have since been repeated by those accusers in court filings, including the defamatory claim that Warmer filmed this of a minor. Additionally, in furtherance of their conspiracy, Gore solicited Warner's personal information, including logins and passwords, from former employees who were entrusted with such information, hacked Warner's computers, phones, email accounts, and or social media accounts, created fictitious email accounts to manufacture purported evidence that Warner was emailing illicit and quote, swatted Warner just days after Wood suddenly appeared all over the media in order to draw further unwanted attention to Warner and the false allegations Wood and Gore conspired to have made against him. Now, we'll get to the swatting thing in a second because this does go on more about that later. However, I do want to know more about Ilma Gore's allegations of hacking into Manson's devices. That is a very, very big claim that I assume they have have some kind of evidence to back that up if they're reporting this in a legal document in a lawsuit. I do remember a point in one of the Phoenix Rising episodes, Evan Rachel Wood mentions also that Manson himself does the same type of hacking that he is claiming that Ilma Gore is doing to him. Later on in page five of this lawsuit, it also states that since at least 2019, Gore has been mired in significant financial troubles. For example, her family members have presented evidence that Gore committed crimes of identity theft by opening credit cards accounts in the names of her twin sister and deceased mother and borrowed money from an elderly family member under the false pretenses claiming that it was to assist with the purchase of a house which Gore never carried out. Gore wrote in a notebook left with her family that her goal of being involved with the Phoenix Act was to make money. The Phoenix Act engages in fundraising, including through multiple listings on crowdfunding websites GoFundMe, where people can donate money to the Phoenix Act. At least one such GoFundMe page for the Phoenix Act stated that its goal was to raise $250,000. On February 1st, 2021, after months of of conspiring with Gore on how to use Wood's celebrity status to recruit other women and coordinate their, quote, stories, Wood posted on her Instagram page the false claim that Warner had abused her. That same day, several other women, assisted and coordinated by Wood and or Gore, sought media attention with remarkably similar public abuse against Warner. Those claims, like Woods, were false. The deluge of allegations against Warner brought renewed attention to the Phoenix Act and Wood, and in so doing, provided more manufactured content for the HBO project. Its director, Amy Berg, confirmed this fact in an interview with Variety, stating that naming Manson obviously created a lot more story for us. It became a two-part film in the edit bay. On or around January 12th, 2022, it was announced that part one of the project, titled Phoenix Phoenix Rising would premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in January 2022, and that both parts would air on HBO in March 2022. Predictably, both Wood and Gore are prominently featured and heroically depicted in the quote, documentary. From approximately 2019 to the present, Wood and Gore have conspired to recruit, coordinate, and pressure people to claim that they were abused by Warner, and that it took 10 or more years to realize this. In furtherance of this wrongful conspiracy, and in order to enrich herself and benefit Wood, Gore committed a number of illegal acts. Wood acted in furtherance of this conspiracy and aided and abetted Gore's unlawful conduct. Wood and Gore have derailed Warner's career. Wood acknowledged as much in Phoenix Rising when she stated that the film itself, which debuted long after her and Gore's orchestrated attack on Warner began, isn't about revenge or like he's a monster and like he needs to be punished and destroyed. He's already destroyed. I 
will say that that kind of seems like it's taken out of context considering the fact that in this documentary from what I remember seeing, to me it sounded like Evan Rachel Wood was just saying that Manson at this point can't be helped, that he is internally destroyed by not only the things that happened in his own past and also destroyed in the way that he has treated other people, specifically the women who he has dated. To me it really sounded like she was just essentially calling him a broken person who was mentally destroyed by everything that happened in his past and his own actions. Wood and Gore recruit, coordinate, and pressure prospective accusers to make false accusations against Warner. Gore solicited prospective accusers by phone, text, message, email, and or social media with messages such as the following. Hey, I know this is a strange way to reach out, but my name is Ilma. I work with the Phoenix Act. I run it alongside Evan Rachel Wood. We were organizing a group of people to meet up in Los Angeles and Zoom or Skype in to talk about experiences they had that might be similar to yours. I'm not sure you would be interested in participating. You aren't obligated to speak, but if you wanted to listen in, that would be fine. It's a small group and you are personally invited. If you wanted to know more first, I would would be happy to jump on the phone and email more details. Best, Ilma. Gore used her proximity to Wood to attract and pressure potential accusers. She bragged to them that she was close with Wood and was acting on behalf of the Phoenix Act, which she ran alongside Wood. Gore wooed potential accusers by claiming that she wanted them to organize through the Phoenix Act Coalition and were personally invited to participate in small groups with Wood. The clear implication was that the potential accusers could also be close to Wood, a famous actress, if they participated and agreed agreed to be featured in Wood's film. These meetings, which provided a form to coordinate were filmed for Phoenix Rising. See, this part really doesn't make a lot of sense to me because Ilma Gore seemed to be reaching out to women who have allegedly had some kind of relationship with Marilyn Manson, somebody else who already is very famous, and I would like to argue is more famous than Evan Rachel Wood. In fact, I haven't heard of the name Evan Rachel Wood before all of this happened. In this lawsuit alone, they even mentioned that Evan Rachel Wood is most known for being the person who dated Marilyn Manson. So if Ilma Gore is reaching out to people who have allegedly already had contact with an already very famous singer, Marilyn Manson, why would Evan Rachel Wood, the girl who is only known for dating Marilyn Manson according to this lawsuit, hold any weight or any type of pull or influence over people's decisions to speak out and not about Marilyn Manson. As further evidence of wrongful coordination, Gore provided prospective accusers with a checklist of 21 fabricated acts of abuse to ensure their public claims against Warner would mirror each other and create the fake perception of a pattern of wrongful conduct. With it being described like that, I can definitely seeing this accusation holding some weight over some of the other things that I've seen so far in this lawsuit. But let's look at it this way. If Ilma Gore is reaching out to people saying we can have a discussion through Zoom or you can sit in with a small group of people to just listen, if that's the introduction to it, I'm assuming that all of the women who were involved in filling this checklist out have likely probably already shared their stories once if not several times prior to filling that checklist out, whether it be privately or publicly. So if we think of it as this checklist was made after those stories were shared, could it be that they were just taking the most common points from each story and writing it out as a checklist? Because when it does come to abusive relationships and abusers with several different victims, the abuser does usually tend to show patterns of behavior and similar patterns in each relationship. So it's not uncommon that the same thing would happen over and over again in different relationships. Therefore, if it was a repetitive behavior, would it be beneficial to make some sort of checklist? I don't really know. Because on the other hand, this definitely would be evident of some sort of coordination. But like I said earlier, this does kind of sound more like a job application. I still do think that maybe they could have just been using this as a way to figure out what happened to who and just keep it organized. But again, without Without that explanation, without any type of rebuttal at this point, I can definitely see how this could be used against them as a claim of coordination. Now, according to this next paragraph, it is claiming that Gore is the one who edited
edited or provided the scripts for people to say, but their proof of that is just this paper that has some sort of testimony written on it. We don't know who wrote this or who it's for or from. In addition to prompting specific allegations with checklists, Gore and Wood's assistance and or acquiescence encouraged prospective accusers to fabricate, change, embellish, and exaggerate their stories, including to make up that they had been raped by Warner, trafficked by Warner, and were too scared to speak out. Indeed, Wood and Gore convinced prospective accusers that their failures to allege of abuse over the past 10 plus years was not because no abuse occurred, but instead because abuse caused people to, quote, repress their memories. Multiple accusers have publicly admitted that until their meetings with Gore and Wood, they had, quote, no memory of abuse, that these meetings unlocked new memories, and that they, quote, learned from other participants in Wood and Gore's groups that they would later accuse Warner of. Again, I do want to say one thing here. When a group of people get together and share events of an experience or trauma that is similar to other people, in this case, a group of alleged victims of Marilyn Manson get together and share stories, chances are you're going to remember things that you have either purposefully forgotten about, in other words, repressed, or in some cases, you might not have noticed something until somebody else says it and you're putting two and two together and you realize, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Again, this isn't something that's uncommon by any means. In certain circumstances, some women have claimed to think that they were about to die or have even wanted to die because of the things they accused Manson of. And if these things really happened, then they were likely under a large amount of stress, so much so that they absolutely could have repressed those memories and feelings because of how traumatic it allegedly was. If you're in a group of people and you share a lot of the same experiences they do with the same person, there's a very large chance you might remember things that you've repressed. But right now we're going to get into something that's a little bit more interesting. We actually do have a little bit more. Again, I wanna remind you that I'm not going over the entire lawsuit, just some main points that have caught my eye. If you wanna check out the full lawsuit, it will be linked in the description below. Some women who Wood and Gore contacted refused to participate because what they were being asked to say was not true. To the contrary, a number of Warner's romantic partners, including some recruited by Wood and Gore, have have come forward to say that the allegations did not match their experiences with him. Greta Aurora, who was recruited by Gore but refused to participate in the coordinated attack, has stated publicly that she was still depicted falsely as a victim in a lawsuit filed by Gore's associate and Warner's former assistant, Ashley Walters. Another huge point in this lawsuit involves a claim that Ilma Gore and Evan Rachel Wood actually forged the notice of an FBI agent who was supposedly involved in this case. And according to Manson, that FBI agent had no idea what was going on. They had no part in it and they were not involved at all. That I think is the biggest situation out of all of this right now. That is very, very, it, it doesn't look too great. I'm gonna be honest, this is something that if not explained is going to be absolutely detrimental towards their case and towards this entire movement they've created. Wouldn't Gore impersonate an actual FBI agent by forging a fictitious letter claiming that Wood and other alleged victims of Warner were in danger? Wouldn't Gore conspire to impersonate a federal agent by creating and distributing a fictitious letter here to as attachment A, as we already looked into previously? The letter which Wood and Gore attributed to a real life federal agent and included a forged signature and fake phone number for that agent agent stated that there was an ongoing law enforcement investigation into Warner and there was concern for the safety of Wood, other victims of Warner, and their families. The federal agent whose name and alleged signature appear on the letter has confirmed that she did not author that letter, had no knowledge of the letter, did not authorize or approve the letter, and has never been involved in any criminal investigation of Warner. The purported federal agency of the letter associates with the agent 
the Federal Violent Crimes Division does not even appear to exist. Screenshots of a conversation between Gore and Wood show that the text of the letter was drafted by Wood and Gore, not the FBI agent. Wood drafted the next letter and asked for and received feedback from Gore, including to remove a reference from an imminent arrest in the conversation copied below, Alabama is Wood, a nickname she was given around the time of her relationship with Warner. While I do want to know how they got these alleged text messages between Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore, the rest of this seems to be the worst and most damaging part of this entire lawsuit. I can't think of a single reason why somebody would need to do this. I can only hope that they have a good explanation whenever they make their rebuttal, but I can't envision or imagine any explanation that could make something like this be okay. But let's read this screenshot. Whoa, I never seen this one. Blank is my new number. Here is the letter. To whom it may concern, please be advised that Miss Evan Rachel Wood is one of the primary witnesses in connection with an impending criminal prosecution in Los Angeles involving an international and well-known public figure. We have advised Miss Wood that in our opinion, it is her and her family's best interest to not be in Los Angeles at the time of this individual's arrest and the criminal proceedings. The safety of Miss Wood, her son, as well as other victims and their families are of our utmost concern during this time. What you think? It's good. I don't know about the letter stating the arrest before it happens. Gore creates a fictitious email account impersonating Warner. For example, upon information and belief in or around September 2019, Gore used these accounts to send and receive emails containing links to Fee. Upon information and belief, these links are believed to have contained prohibited content as the URLs currently do not work and thus were likely taken down. As another example, upon information and belief, Gore used fake email accounts to create documents that look like Warner communicating with attorneys regarding a criminal investigation. In one such email dated February 8th, 2021, just days after Wood and several others made fictitious claims of abuse against Warner in a coordinated attack, BH Warner 1969 received an email from a person purporting to be writing on behalf of Warner's attorney. However, the email's purported sender did not work for or ever work for that attorney. Upon information and belief, Gore created these documents as part of wrongful conspiracy against Warner to enhance her reputation and esteem with Wood, the Phoenix Act, and persons that she was soliciting or had solicited to speak out against Warner and ultimately to enrich herself. Warner first learned of these fake email accounts and fake emails described above in November 2021 when copies of these emails were shared with him. Before that, Warner had never received any emails sent to or from those fake email accounts. Accordingly, Warner did not discover and a reasonable and diligent investigation would not have disclosed that Gore's use of fake email accounts contributed to Warner's harm. Gore swats Warner in February 2021. As they state, swatting is the harassment tactic of making a hoax or prank report to emergency services to elicit the dispatch of a large number of armed police officers, be it the SWAT team to a particular location or address. Swatting is often triggered by a false report of serious law enforcement emergencies such as a homicide situation or mental health emergency. For example, the claim that an individual at a certain location is and or unwell. In my opinion, this seems like it was actually a wellness check, not swatting, because when you're trying to swat somebody, it actually is a lot more malicious. Usually you call as anonymous and you're making preposterous claims and it's usually something along the lines of this person has some sort of lethal item that is going to cause harm to others, therefore creating such a high alert that it involves a SWAT team arriving at their house. And with some of these cases, the people who make these false calls to the police station or the FBI can get arrested. So when people are swatting, it's not something to take lightly. And if this truly was the case, if Manson could truly prove that this person's intent was to swat them, bring physical harm to them, and embarrass him, that might hold a lot more consequence than just a lawsuit. I could be wrong here, but this really seems to be a wellness check, not an attempt to swat someone. A wellness check is done when you're worried that the person you're doing the check on is going to harm themselves and they send a police car 
or a few police officers to the house to check and make sure that that person is okay. Now, according to Manson, apparently helicopters and everything were involved, but there didn't seem to be any proof that a SWAT team was actually involved, hence the name SWATting. Gore swatted Warner on or around February 3rd, 2021. The LAPD was notified that the FBI had received a call from a, quote, friend of Warner named Ilma Gore, who claimed that an emergency existed because she had not been able to reach him and was concerned for his safety. This report was false. Warner was at home with his wife and a guest and not in any danger. Gore knew her report was false. She and Warner have never even met. She had never been Warner's, quote, friend and had no basis to believe Warner posed any risk or danger to himself. Again, to me, this sounds like a wellness check. The only thing that doesn't seem honest here is the fact that Gore claimed that she was Manson's friend. But considering how many times that in this documentary, Evan Rachel Wood and her mother other, as well as articles all claimed that Manson would repetitively self-harm if Evan Rachel Wooden would not pick up the phone. And in fact, according to a Spin Magazine article where they interviewed Marilyn Manson, Marilyn Manson allegedly said himself, and every time I called her that day, I called 158 times, I took a razor blade and I cut myself on my face or on my hands. I look back and it was a really stupid thing to do. This was intentional. This was scarification. And this was like a tattoo. I wanted to show her the pain she put me through. It was like, I want you to physically see what you've done. It sounds made up, but it's completely true. And I don't give a shit if people believe or not. I got the scars to prove it. It started with me cutting myself 158 times with a razor blade. So with all of that being said, all of these different accounts being taken into consideration, including Manson's. And to remind you, this was an interview from 2009, years before any of this was even thought of or conspired. I would really like to think that this was definitely a wellness check done to make sure that Manson wasn't going to self-harm or do anything extremely violent to himself or anybody else in his house because they claimed, and he himself has claimed, according to Spin Magazine, that he is capable of doing this type of stuff. That he has self-harmed purposefully to show other people that they have hurt him. So with that being said, I think there definitely was cause for concern, especially if they knew that Manson knew they were working on this documentary. I can definitely see why they would have called to do a check on him. I don't think this was swatting. In fact, I don't even think SWAT teams were involved. At most, there were helicopters by police officers. An actual SWAT team would be kicking down your door if you don't answer it. And another key thing from swatting is usually Usually the person swatting someone doesn't give their name or actual information because they know that this is like an attempted murder or at the very least know that this is something they can get in a lot of trouble for. There is one part of the lawsuit, however, that claims that Ilma Gore apparently tipped off paparazzi before the police showed up to Manson's house. If that is true, then that changes this entire situation, but they don't really provide any evidence of that other than this. Firstly, it says upon further information and belief, which to me makes it seem like it's more of an assumption than concrete fact, but that's just my assumption on the language here. That could mean something else legally that I'm unaware of. So you'll notice it points throughout this entire lawsuit, there are numbers next to certain sentences. This is usually directing you to a link to support their claims, and this number right here directs you to a link to support their claims against Ilma Gore tipping off the paparazzi. That evening, video and images of the police response were posted and went viral online as it was reported that, quote, Marilyn Manson's home was swarming with cops after a worried friend called concerned for the singer's well-being, saying that they'd been unable to get in touch with him for hours. Now, again, if you follow that source next to the number, it takes you to a website, TMZ.com, and it does quote that same thing, saying he'd be unable to get in touch with him for hours. But then the next paragraph states, law enforcement sources tell TMZ they received a call Wednesday for a welfare check by someone who said they hadn't heard from the singer and were worried something may have happened. So this source claims that the law enforcement basically informed them of that. Like maybe their reporter asked a police officer on the scene is what I'm assuming. The next source that they link
link is another article, but this one's by page six. But the thing is, page six references the TMZ article that we just discussed. And not only that, but this article doesn't really paint Manson in the best light, considering the next paragraph talks about a witness hearing somebody saying that they wanted to leave the house, allegedly. And the last source linked on this subject straight up called this a welfare check. I have also taken note that this website also happens to be The Sun, which is the website that Johnny Depp tried to sue in regards to the Amber Heard case. This swatting by Gore was part of a scheme to benefit the Phoenix Act, Wood, and the film project, and to curry favor with Wood and potential and existing accusers against Warner. Based on press coverage of the police response, which reported on the disturbing incident at Warner's home and all allegations levied days earlier, but not that this welfare check was a hoax. Gore was successful. Gore hacks Warner's computer files and social media accounts. Upon information and belief, Gore gained unauthorized access, e.g. hack, Warner's email login and password, social media login and password, and social security number. Among other sources, Gore solicited and obtained this information from Ashley Walters. Walters was Warner's former assistant and one of the women recruited by Gore and Wood to make accusations against Warner. As part of her work for Warner, Walters was entrusted with Warner's private information by Warner and his representatives. As is common in the entertainment business and numerous other professions that handle sensitive, potentially high-profile manners, Walters entered into a confidentiality agreement that prohibited her from disclosing such information. Gore procured from Walters, among other private and protected information, Walters' email and social media logins and passwords, and Warner's social security number, home addresses, and phone number. Gore procured this information knowing that she would use it to gain access to and use data Data, a computer, a computer system, a computer network, and or computer services. Indeed, Gore has a history with precisely this type of wrongful conduct. In November of 2021, a Santa Cruz County judge issued a temporary restraining order against Gore after her twin sister recounted that Gore committed digital spying and stalking against me, made me fear that I and my children were in immediate danger and serious physical injury, and disturbed my peace, liberty, and free will with coercive control. Gore has boasted that she has a computer science background and is interested in hacking. Upon further information and belief, Gore used information provided by Walters and others to gain access to Warner's personal details, private conversations, email accounts, phones, and social media accounts. Gore used the information she obtained as part of her scheme to orchestrate and promulgate false accusations against Warner, including the coordinated false accusation against Warner on February 1st, 2021, and thereafter, which would bring further attention to the Phoenix Act, Wood, and the film project, and to curry favor with Wood and and potential and existing accusers against Warner. Gore slanders Warner. Between 2019 and 2021, as part of her multi-pronged attack on Warner, Gore had multiple conversations with prospective accusers, in which she claimed that a 1996 short film made by Warner called Groupie depicted child abuse and CP. During one such conversation in 2021, Gore said that the actress in Groupie was a minor at the time of the shoot and was dead, and that if the video were to be seen, Warner would be indicted. I'm pretty sure the part where she said Warner would be indicted was quoting someone else who claimed that if Manson showed this to anybody else, it would bring him a lot of trouble. But moving on, Gore's statements about Warner and Groupie are demonstrably false. Gore knew that they were false or acted with reckless disregard of their falsity. The actress Paula Weiss was 22 years old at the time the film was made. She has publicly stated that she was not a minor, was involved in conceptualizing the plot of of the film and was acting and hamming it up. Clips from Groupie were featured in a 1998 tour documentary called Dead to the World. Weiss not only was thanked in the credits of that film, but also went on the star in music videos including Manson's Long Hard Road Out of Hell in 1997 and Garbage's Push It in 1998. The director of Groupie and Dead to the World, Joseph Cultus, has publicly stated that Gore's claims are all fake. Still promulgating these and other falsehoods was part of Gore's scheme to orchestrate an amplify false accusations against Warner, thereby bolstering Wood's claim that Warner had been her and others' abuser. This, in turn, would bring further attention to the Phoenix Act, the associated film project, and curry favor with Wood and potential and existing accusers against Warner. Indeed, Gore's defamatory allegations regarding her groupie have been repeated in at least one civil complaint filed against Warner and consequently have reverberated through the press. This is entirely unsurprising given that Gore discussed the 
these false allegations with prospective accusers. Maybe I'm unaware that Gore could have been the one to spread this rumor, but I do know that this groupie film was discussed widely throughout social media and other platforms, and I myself did not know the identity of this person who was in the film groupie, only the claims made about it. So that does change some perspective in the regards to this being a film where Manson and others allegedly did something horrific to a girl. Wood condoned and encouraged Gore to promulgate defamatory falsehoods about Warner in order to further their conspiracy. So somebody I know actually made a pretty decently sized Google Doc going over several points in different circumstances that don't really add up with the claims made against Marilyn Manson. There are a few good points that stand out in this document, such as the fact that Evan Rachel Wood would repetitively say she was a teenager when her and Manson began dating. While that was technically true, she was at the age of 19. There is a very large age gap between Wood and Manson, no doubt about it, but she was over the age of 18, so this was by all means a legal relationship. The technicalities of this seem like they can hurt her case more than help because the wording makes it seem very misleading. Can you tell us how did this video shoot affect you and how do you respond to both his denial and his lawyer's denial? Uh, well, we did not have on set. I was on set. It's a difference. Um, and when you're inebriated like that, you, you, you can't consent, especially as a minor. Regarding Esme Bianco and Ashley Walters, there are claims, not by Manson's legal team or the lawsuit, but presented by outside sources, that they both had allegedly taken Manson's Jaguar and crashed it during an evening where they were driving under the influence. I want to repeat myself and say that this is definitely alleged at this point. The part that is pretty factual is the fact that Walters did get into a DUI as per her court papers state, but when when it comes to her crashing Marilyn Manson's Jaguar, the only photos I can find are this picture in particular, and the only source for this information that I currently know of is this post right here, which is a very pro-Manson post, so you could take that for what it is. However, I have not seen any articles, clips, or any sources where Manson mentions this whatsoever or brings this up at all. The only thing that I can find find is a different incident where somebody left his house and crashed their own car and unfortunately passed away, but that was a completely different incident. So, like I said, take it with a grain of salt, but with the fact that it is admitted in Ashley Walters' own court papers that she did get arrested for a DUI, it's something to think about. Now, these claims were brought up to point out that Manson couldn't be sleep-depriving women in the late hours of the night because this shows that he was in fact asleep when this happened. However, during this old interview with Manson, he himself publicly shares his sleeping schedule. And do you ever wish you had a 9 to 5 job? Can you a plumber or an electrician? I wake up from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Sleeping schedules can change, so I don't think this can be enough proof to confirm or deny the claims of sleep deprivation. Drinking and driving is definitely irresponsible though, and if I had an assistant who crashed my car while driving under the influence, I'd fire them too. Further sources outside of the lawsuit claim that Ashley Smithline posted an image on Instagram of what she claimed were scratches on her body from Manson. However, there have been claims that this image was reverse searched and found on Pinterest, and once called out, out, the image was allegedly removed and never addressed. To my knowledge, these claims outside of Manson's lawsuit have yet to be addressed by Walters, Bianco, or Smithline. It's something to keep in mind when trying to sort through all of these accusations. There is so much that is still going on being shared about both Manson and his accusers. This story has gotten very muddy since the beginning of March where Manson filed his lawsuit and the release of the Phoenix Rising documentary. There are many things that still make me question Manson. Manson, one being that according to several different news outlets, over a dozen women at this point have come forward with accusations against him, more than just the women mentioned in this video. Another being his own confession that he would self-harm when Evan Rachel Wood failed to answer her phone, as well as claiming that he wanted to bash her face in with a sledgehammer, or admitting to putting a gun in somebody's mouth, I definitely still believe at this point he does have violent tendencies due to these reports specifically. But that is my own personal belief, and you are 
or free to make up yours as well. Also, why is nobody bringing up the fact that four other lawsuits were filed against him? Granted, again, some of the contents in Manson's lawsuit are indeed quite detrimental towards Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore, especially Gore. At this point, I think Ilma Gore's involvement with this entire situation is tarnishing every single woman's claims against Manson, and with that allegedly fake FBI letter, Evan would also be harming their case severely unless they have some magical explanation as to why this happened or what is going on. By the way, Evan Rachel Wood has made a response regarding the lawsuit during an appearance on The View. I ask you this because he filed a lawsuit against where he claims you and another activist made knowingly false statements to police, right. prospective accusers, that you listed specific acts of abuse that prospective might claim against Warner, and forged a document purporting to be from an FBI agent. He also responded to the documentary saying, quote, nothing that uh, Evan Rachel Wood Ilma Gore or their hand-picked co-conspirators have said on this matter can be trusted. This is just more of the same from a group who falsehood after falsehood, end quote. Can you respond to that? I'd like to give you the opportunity to do that. Sure. Um, well, I can't, you know, obviously speak about any of the specific allegations of the lawsuit, but I, I, I am not scared. I am sad because this is how, this is how it works. This is, this is what pretty much every survivor that, that it tries to expose uh, someone in a position of power goes through. Mm -hmm. And this is the part of the retaliation that keeps her quiet. This is why people don't want to come forward because this is, no. this was expected. Um, I'm very confident that I have the truth on my side and that, and that the truth will come out. And you know, that this is, you know, clearly timed before the documentary and mm -hmm. you know, for, for this is the reason. Um, so yes, again, I'm not, I'm not doing this to, to clear my name. I'm doing this to, I'm, I'm doing this to, to, to sound the alarm that there is a dangerous part. And I don't, I don't want anybody getting near him, you know? And so people can think whatever they want about me. I have to let the legal process run its course. And you know, I'm, I'm steady as a rock. One thing I really want to point out before ending this video is that there seem to be a lot of different women coming out with several different claims against Marilyn Manson. What is really, really unfortunate and really, really scary is that if one person out of all of these women coming forward is not being 100% honest or is fabricating things to get attention or clout from this in any way, it is detrimental to the entire situation regarding Manson. Because if even one person isn't telling the truth, that ruins it for everybody else involved because that's going to make people speculate that all of these other people are lying too. There is some skepticism that I have regarding Ilma Gore. There do seem to be a few things that aren't quite adding up. However, along with that, I think in this lawsuit that is being presented, I think some things aren't quite adding up there either. So all in all, I think at this point, there is a lot of muddied water and there is a lot of stuff that we, the public, just don't quite know the full story at this point. When I first covered this story last year, I was in full support and belief that every single person involved in this case was being 100% truthful. And the biggest reason why is because of Evan Rachel Wood specifically. She has been speaking out against abuse for years and years. And years ago, she discussed having an abuser and would not publicly name them for a very long time, seemingly out of fear. Despite that, she would still do a lot of legal work trying to help and support women who are in abusive situations and deal with domestic violence. But at this point, I'm kind of just waiting at the edge of my seat, wondering what's going to change, what updates are going to come out of this. If he's filing a lawsuit, I really wanna know how that turns out and how that goes. I think at this point, we just have to wait and see how this lawsuit turns out what happens from here. With that being said, thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end of this video. Thank you so much to everybody who has been supporting me over on Patreon, especially Lewis, Miss Tanisha, Anthony Tressout, and Michelle, and Dreamer WM. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And with that being said, I will see you in the next video.